Hi everyone, we're going to get started. Um, so welcome uh, and thank you all for joining the Institute for Rebo Rebooting Social Media for today's fall speaker series event, Social Processes of Online Hate. My name is Shelby Elitmani, I'm a program coordinator with the Institute and I'm pleased to introduce you all to our guest speakers, Joe Walther and Sahana Agupa. Joe Walther holds the Bertelson President, excuse me, Presidential Chair in Technology and Society at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he is a distinguished professor of communication. His research focuses on the impact of interpersonal and intergroup dynamics in the attitudes and behaviors of people developed via mediated interaction in personal relationships, groups, and inter-ethnic inter conflict. He's the co-editor of the recently edited volume, Social Processes of Online Hate, which we'll be discussing today. He's also a 2023-2024 RSM Visiting Scholar, and we are so happy to have him back on campus with us today. Sahana Udupa is Professor of Media Anthropology at LMU Munich and founder of the Center for Digital Dignity. She's also a current fellow with the Berkman Klein Center, where she's exploring the growing role of small social media platforms in shaping contentious speech and will advance comparative research on encrypted messaging and extreme speech. She's also the author of the forthcoming book, What's Happened in the World? Disinformation, Encryption, and Extreme Speech, which is set to release in spring 2025. We'll begin by hearing presentations from both of our guests and then turn to you all here in, the, in person and in the Zoom room uh, for questions. Please join me in welcoming Joe and Sahana. Thank you very much. It's so, so nice to be back on campus. I learned so much uh, last year and got so much work done, including uh, finishing and editing on this book. I want to thank Shelby for putting this event together, Guzo for helping to manage it, and, and the ongoing support of a couple of folks who aren't here, and that's uh, uh, Tony and uh, Patrick, who are always making things happen. Louder? Can you? I can. There we go. I also have to thank uh, Ron Rice, my co-editor at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, without whom, this would not have been uh, the, the product that it is. Ron's a smart guy and a super editor. I also want to recognize Jordan Kramer, who is here with us today up from ADL in New York. Jordan's a super researcher and is one of the uh, contributing authors on the chapter today. I'm so glad to finally meet you in person. And I'm so glad you're here today. This work came about uh, because uh, uh, because I'm a student of interaction and I needed to learn things. I was interested in the proposition that what might control or influence the ebb and flow of the posting of hate online could be the interactions among the haters, uh, their, their fans, their admirers. We all know that online hate is a problem when its victims encounter the messages. We know that online hate is a problem because of its potential to reinforce and magnify existing prejudices. The research usually looks at those directions, but I think interaction among the perpetrators might have been an important thing to think about. I started reading the best research I could find on the subject and was fortunate enough to gather those brilliant scholars to um, help put together uh, first a conference and then the collection of this book. What I'd like today to do is advertise the book by talking to you about these amazing chapters and contributions that I learned so much from. I'll tell you 30 seconds about the chapter, and then we'll hear a minute from um, many of the contributors. So the first chapter is something that Ron Rice and I wrote. It's an introduction to the book where we lay out the proposition that hate messaging is a cross product of communicative interactions among hate posters and the affordances of media, and that what appears individually, individual is a social process. It's not random, it's not organized. Unorganized is highly coordinated. 
Iran has these thoughts this on this particular subject. chapter highlights the groundbreaking and paradigm shifting work of the outstanding contributors in their research. It summarizes the justification of the book's focus. It describes the background of the book, how it came about, and it summarizes each chapter. In general, the book argues and shows that through review, theory, and research, that much of online hate behavior is fundamentally social in nature and involves social processes, including things like sharing content, memes, symbols, actors, websites, social media platforms, news media, leaders and followers, roles, genres, rumor, conspiracy theories, and ardent ideologies. The next chapter is a contribution that I put together to try to make a case that online hate should be looked at as a social process. It gives anecdotes from the literature, it gives evidence from the literature, um, it, it provides um, symbols and accounts from the literature that help us um, accept the argument that we need to be looking at online hate as a social process. And this handsome guy has comments about it. Just about everybody, social media users and researchers particularly, everybody assumes that hate posts are put online in order to upset people, insult people, and degrade the people that those messages are about. Well, there's no question they're offensive and sickening when the targets of those messages encounter them. But maybe the potential victims aren't actually the primary audience of hate messages. Maybe people post hate messages for other hate message posters. How would we know? That's the point of this particular chapter. It explains that the most extreme and insulting messages, the ones that urge violence and racial annihilation, those messages show up in places where most people actually don't go. Those messages aren't usually directed toward the victims. They show up in fringe spaces. They use obscure in-group slang and symbols that the victims wouldn't generally understand. They try to amuse and entertain each other with memes and quips that they think are funny, that most of us would think are anything but funny. This is a glimpse into some of the social processes of online hate, generated by haters, for haters, and some of the ways that they work. The next chapter in our book is by Stephanie Tong, a professor at Wayne State University. It's a really nice summary and overview of the existing research about online hate, aside from the uh, uh, motives and gratifications of the perpetrators of hate. So Stephanie gives a really nice textbook version of what other findings and research strains are in the literature. Um, one of the things that I learned while writing the chapter for the social processes of online hate volume um, with Joe and Ron is how truly big the study of online hate has become um, and how interdisciplinary um, the scholarship is. And while that's really great that we're all working on these various um, phenomena, I think that one thing I hope we all do moving forward is to kind of read outside of our home disciplines and really strive to make connections and build a shared vocabulary um, in terms of the various questions that we're asking, the way that we measure different constructs and the way that we define um, those concepts and ideas so that different audiences can really have a stronger understanding overall. The next chapter by Walter D. Caserti talks about incels. And so now we're starting to get into various contexts, different kinds of haters and their behavior. De Caserti has studied incels uh, uh, among, other, among other groups that perpetrate or advocate violence against people. He shows us that the incels online discuss their disregard for Stacy's. They uh, discuss their disregard for Chad. So Stacy's are sexually attracted women who incels will never experience. Chad's are the men who they are jealous of. And, and De Caserti introduces male peer support theory, um, how men tr 
praying each other and hating, consoling each other in their misery. It's a fascinating theory applied to a variety of contexts, including in cells. It focuses on, in the words of Laura Bates, the extremism nobody is talking about. Uh, more specifically, I look at the ways in which uh, male peer support processes among uh, incels contribute to offline and online variants of woman abuse, such, such as psychological abuse, physical violence, sexual violence, stalking, and so on. Male peer support is a concept that I developed in 1988, and it refers to the attachments to male peers and the resources that these men provide that encourage and legitimate um, woman abuse, different types of woman abuse. Now my chapter just doesn't focus only on um, male peer support processes, but it also looks at policies. What can men do? How do we transform men into active bystanders? Uh, most men are what we would refer to as well-meaning men. They care about women, they're concerned about equity and so on, but they need to take it a step further and they need to confront the hate processes that are um, described in my chapter. Uh, we are living in very dangerous times and we need more men to get actively involved in efforts to curb uh, misogynist hate groups like the incels. Chapter five is by Anton and Petter Tornberg. Anton is in Sweden, his brother Petter is in Amsterdam. They have been following uh, Stormfront.org for over 20 years, or they have been studying the transcripts of Stormfront for over 20 years. Uh, they analyze language quantitatively and thematically. They show that as newcomers join Stormfront, which is the, the oldest white nationalist site on the web, as newcomers join, their language <coughs> converges with the old timers their ways of thinking start to mirror the old timers as well. It's a place for storytelling and you're sitting around the virtual campfire together, they argue. Fringe online communities seem to function as a form of incubators of radicalization and online hate. The dominant explanation for this has been the so-called echo chambers, that we only hear arguments from one side and so deliberation tends to make us more and more extreme in our positions. We wanted to try to find a more sociological understanding of what actually happens when people engage with these online communities. We focus on the case of Stormfront, one of the oldest and most infamous online extremist communities. And we use natural language processing to analyze over 20 years of conversations within this community. And what we found here was far from any rational arguments and opinions. We came to think of the community more as a, as a digital campfire, like a, a place to, to gather around, to share stories and feelings and to thereby create a, a shared identity. And this, this helped the members on the forum to, to turn feelings of, of anxiety, of loneliness and frustration to more to anger and, and to action. And through this analysis, we develop a more sociological understanding of these fringe online spaces. Next is by Sahana Udupa and her colleague, Alin Tundrilla Gerald. Uh, they study, uh, they start with a fascinating scenario, deal of the day, a fake auction online, and they bring together themes of sex, porn, political hate, religious majoritarianism. It's a fascinating cultural critique that centers itself on some hateful online episodes. Uh, fake public auctions, uh, various critiques, cultural critiques and online critiques, among other factors, feeding hatred towards Muslims and women online, veiled as entertainment and weird forms of fun. In 2021 22, Indian Muslim women faced a unique form of online harassment. Politically vocal Muslim women were auctioned online on GitHub, programmed apps called Sulidi deals and bully by. A respondent struggled to make sense of this online auction. One of them said, my family and my brother were furious that we were being sold like sex workers. In this chapter, we analyze this obscure activity of auctioning women and a corpus of provocative content that surrounded this practice. Uh, we look into Telegram chats, Twitter, YouTube, and different social media platforms where such auctions and conversations were organized. 
we were struck by how practices of pornography shape this kind of harassment. So our key point is the importance of pornography in anti-women hate cultures and how digital sexual violence gets enmeshed with majoritarian political aggression via the consumption of porn in a variety of social media and social interaction processes. Chapter seven by Adam Burstyn, an emerging sociologist, looks at rigidly mediated spillover as a catalyst of radicalization. His chapter is fascinating. He embedded himself in uh, campus uh, political groups at a number of different universities. And he discovered that as some of these college campus political groups were joined by well-meaning new members who themselves had been involved in alt-right interactions and, and uh, other nefarious movements online as high school kids, it kind of caught on. It infected the group. They wanted to learn how to manufacture these memes. They wanted to learn what edgy expressions that they could use. They became radicalized so much so that one of these chapters eventually was shut down on campus. And this is the story of how those things developed. This chapter was inspired by a phenomenon wherein historically moderate uh, conservative youth groups were publicly declaring support for white supremacy, right-wing extremist conspiracy theories, and non-democratic governance. To understand why this was happening, I conducted a multi-site ethnography at three chapters of a historically moderate conservative youth group. I found that radicalization was occurring because they were recruiting members of digital hate movements, namely the alt-right, which is a constellation of white supremacist and ethno-nationalist hate movements, and the manosphere, which is a constellation of male supremacist movements. Digitally mediated spillover describes a process wherein a digital social movement spills over its boundaries, um, giving its personnel, ideology, tactics, and movement culture uh, to a new social movement. Radicalization stemming from digitally mediated spillover was a slow process that began with uh, humor and desensitization to extremist ideology and ultimately ended up in the acceptance of, you know, tactics that showed a disregard for the democratic process and public de declarations of support for white supremacy and uh, condemnations of homosexuality. It's my hope that digitally mediated spillover is applied to new contexts beyond radicalized conservative youth movements. Chapter eight, hate parties. This is the, the chapter that uh, Jordan Kramer uh, contributed to. Hate parties, networked anti-Semitism from fringes to the YouTube. It's a fascinating discovery of how cross-platform hate takes place. But as we will see in another chapter, sometimes cross-platform hate is hate that's organized in one space to attack another space. In this chapter, the author discovered that sometimes hate is organized in, in one space to go complement and extend and continue the vitriol that shows up in another space. So from free spaces to YouTube videos that the anti-Semites admire and elaborate on and encourage. It's fascinating that the, the users know the limits of the community standards of the various platforms on which they communicate. And these conversations are taking place in multiple platforms at the same time. A fascinating phenomenon. Joe, I see you phenomenon in online. extemporaneous, but no, Stevie did it, so. Sure, let's see what um, the first author Stevie Ray has to say. There's a well-known phenomenon in online hate and harassment research whereby uh, hate purveyors out on what we might call the fringes of social media, 4chan, Gab, Getter, uh, will identify a piece of media uh, in the mainstream to harass, to target, uh, and to terrorize. Uh, and coordinate action uh, out on the fringes to then do a, a what is called a hate raid on, um, on this piece of targeted media. What we looked at in our chapter is a related phenomenon, but one that hasn't gotten nearly as much attention. 
uh, where uh, uh, hate purveyors out on the fringes identify a piece of media not for targeting for harassment, but to uplift because its message is more or less aligned with um, the kind of messaging that they support, um, in this case, anti-Semitic messaging. So we looked at uh, a, a number of videos on YouTube where uh, a link had been shared out on a fringe platform uh, and people had been more or less encouraged to come into the comments and have what we call a hate party uh, to, to engage in hateful rhetoric. And uh, what you get is a thread that doesn't look that different from something you might find out on 4chan. Uh, moving forward, researchers and policymakers will really need to pay attention to these cross-platform dynamics. Um, and how loopholes in policy and in um, link sharing are being exploited by bad actors to, uh, to push hate into the mainstream, to, to normalize it. Chapter 9, Information Sharing and Content Framing Across Multiple Platforms, is a really uh, nice, rigorous account of how existing hate groups are using Facebook and have been using Twitter to share their dogma, to post links to the news stories that favor their positions, and to do, to do this in order to garner new recruits and sustain the beliefs of the recruits that are loyal to their uh, extreme positions. We discuss information sharing and content framing by hate groups across social media platforms. Uh, specifically, we provide um, outlook on hate movements within USA, both from the perspective of physically located hate organizations and their thousands of online followers across Twitter and Facebook. So we discuss hate frame code book uh, that records framing strategies used by hate groups, uh, which allows us to understand how um, hate groups strategize communication around platform affordances. And it also reinforces that communication happening in these uh, moments is more nuanced than hate speech. It actually involves intellectual and info, uh, influential narratives. And when it comes to information sharing, uh, we outline various social roles played by online accounts in uh, distributing hate information across platforms. So uh, overall, this work suggests that uh, through participatory activism, uh, the picture of online hate has now shifted from a few radical websites to thousands of online followers uh, with affordances to share bad information uh, with the mass. Chapter 10, Detecting Antisocial Norms uh, in Online Discussion by a, a group of researchers at University of Arizona uh, and, and Utah uh, gives us really a, a fine detailed account of novel methodology for detecting and classifying social norms and hate behaviors in a variety of online spaces. They also give a really fascinating analysis of how norms are perpetrated through upvotes and downvotes in discussion spaces, how people are attuned to not only the upvotes that they get, but the upvotes that others get, which establishes norms for people to emulate uh, within these discussion spaces. In our chapter, we argue that two sources of social affirmation can shape one's decision to comment in an antisocial manner online. On the one hand, people are more likely to comment in an antisocial manner if they've done so before and have been rewarded for it in the form of votes or likes. On the other hand, people are more likely to comment in an antisocial manner when other people in the same thread are also commenting in an antisocial manner. We test for how these two forms of social affirmation shape the spread of antisocial commenting across three data sets. We start by showing that the theory holds in conversations on the Arizona Daily Star website, a local newspaper. We then compare discussions of the January 6th Capitol riots on Reddit and Twitter. We find that these two forms of social affirmation explain the spread of antisocial commenting on Twitter, but less so on Reddit. We argue that many of the tools that are being used to classify antisocial commenting can be applied to study the spread of antisocial commenting at scale and the impact of these two social mechanisms. Two chapters to go. Chapter 11 by John Lucas Stringhini and Jeremy Blackburn, uh, Blackburn 
is a fascinating data analytic and explanative account of cross-platform raids. These fellows and, and their collaborators have been capturing uh, 4chan data for a long time and doing very close temporal analysis of where the 4chan people give links to uh, show raids, either on uh, mainstream platforms or give links to show to Zoom bombing episodes. And they have tracked the behavior in those raids and show that it's clearly no accident. Uh, they, but they've also shown that back in 4chan, the conversations continue contemporaneous to the attacks, that haters are staying in touch with each other, giving each other tips, giving each other, as Sahana Dupa has called it, high fives for their upsetting behavior. Hey guys, I'm Jeremy. I'm Gianluca. And uh, we spent the last 10 years trying to understand uh, how coordinated hate campaigns go down. In our chapter, we share some of this knowledge with you. So we found that these harassment campaigns uh, are split in several different phases. So first, somebody picks a target, which might be an online resource, a Twitter account, or a YouTube video that they want to uh, attack. And then the trolls on the co in the community, they will try and uh, find more information about the victim, try to figure out what to say to uh, harm them, and so on and so forth. And then the actual attack will start, where uh, hate speech and all sorts of uh, bad stuff gets shared. And maybe the most interesting aspect is that after the, the hate attack's been executed, uh, the perpetrators don't just go away. Instead, they come back and they report to each other. They discuss what they did and they savor things, right? They savor the, uh, the, the harm that they caused somebody. They're celebrating it. Yeah, so check out our chapter for more fun information like this. The last chapter of the book by my good colleague Ron Rice uh, talks about background scholarship. What's happening in popular media? What's happening in academic uh, uh, research about online hate? What are the trends? He also looks back at the chapters of the book, talk about methodologies, interventions, and future research needs. And I'd like to summarize chapter 12, which briefly reviews prior coverage of online hate. It actually lays out some of the propositions of the general model, and it summarizes the main topics uh, across all the chapters in the book. And different online platforms offer a variety of levels of different affordances, and each of the affordances then influence what kinds of online behavior uh, can occur. The third section summarizes material across all the chapters. Um, it identifies the main concepts, the theories, and evidence as covered in all the chapters. And then it summarizes a variety of contextual factors in online hate. This has to do with perpetrators, venues, targets of victims, topics, mechanisms, and effects. Um, it discusses uh, a lot of the challenges that are involved with conducting this online research. What's the definition of online hate? That's varying and ambiguous sometimes. There's tension between freedom of speech and protection from harm. There's issues of privacy. There's issues of monitoring and governance. There's variation in platform features and therefore data access. And there's ambiguity in hidden messages of the content and image. So they're not easily content analyzed and sometimes can't even be understood unless you are a member of the social group. And finally, the chapter ends with a discussion of possible interventions at a wide uh, range of levels and policies. We've gotten great support as we worked on this book together. A wonderful endorsement from Sonia Livingstone, who's just a, an amazing, prominent researcher at the London School of Economics and a BKC affiliate. She was kind enough to review a preliminary copy and lend her endorsement to it, as was Jay-Z here in the Berkman Klein Center in the RSM program, who uh, looked at the drafts and said, this is good work and uh, was uh, fortunate enough, supportive enough to put his name on the book as well. I'm uh, so grateful to all the contributing authors, not only for their brilliant work, their insightful lessons on social processes of online hate, but for their generosity. It would have been really boring for me to stand up here and talk about 12 chapters <laughs> without having them tell you in their own words what the highlights were to look for and were kind enough uh, generous enough to uh, uh, produce these videos so I could share them with you. 
The book is available on uh, open access. Uh, this uh, this uh, 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 scan and this URA will tell you take you to the book and any of its chapters, which we encourage you to read. Thank you so much for your attention. We'll have Professor Odupa speak for a little while, and then we're take, glad to take uh, uh, Q and A sessions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Professor Walter, Joe, for your fantastic and very comprehensive introduction to this important volume. <clears throat> I think uh, this is uh, so timely, and I think it is such an important contribution to digital hate scholarship because it focuses on very intricate dynamics of online interactions and online communities. And online communities have been in the focus for some time now. But I think what Walter's uh, and Rice volume and also uh, Professor Walter's individual contributions bring to this debate is a very theoretically clear, structured argument about how and why social interaction aspects should be foregrounded in understanding hate. And this shift of emphasis, I think, is important to consider. And as he says, online hate is produced as part of complex social processes among the hate messengers themselves. And uh, this particular you know, work is so inspiring and we heard so many different chapters um, uh, speaking and contributing to this framework. And what I will do now, I think, um, is uh, <clears throat> draw out the synergies between this framework and uh, what we call extreme speech framework. And when uh, Joe invited us uh, to a workshop last year, that's what was uh, very striking the synergies between uh, what he calls social processes of hate and uh, also different chapters that we see in this volume and the framework of extra extreme speech that we have developed across different um, uh, words for some years now. So I will highlight these synergies, talk a little bit about our chapter um, and also um, talk uh, about some methodological points and these are going to be brief reflections on methodology uh, I will close with these reflections. So, first of all, what is extreme speech? We define extreme speech as speech acts that stretch the boundaries of legitimate speech along the twin axis of truth, falsity, and civility, incivility. So, for us, the main objective has been to exceed the legal normative focus in culpability and intentionality based studies and to instead explore with ethnographic depth um, what do people actually do what are the actual ways in which people participate in hate cultures and therefore we argue that the production circulation and consumption of hate cultures should be seen as much as a cultural practice a social phenomenon and a techno-political manifestation uh, as much as it is a legal normative concern so when we say it's a cultural practice, we are talking about situated speech cultures of online use in relation to broader struggles over meanings of civility and information. And that cultural variation and cultural struggles over what is information, what is civility is very important for us. And then when we talk about social phenomenon, we are uh, highlighting how extreme speech co-creates relations of belonging and unbelonging. And as such, it is embedded in a broader set of social practices cohering around internet media. And by techno-political manifestation, we highlight the flow of political and market power through technology and the materialities of the internet in shaping and expressing political action. So as you can see, the focus on practice is extremely important for us. And in media studies, as Nick Caldrey and other scholars have also pointed out, it relates to what people do with media. And with practice theory, we might also see these agentic moments as already embedded in structural conditions, which they also reshape in turn. And therefore, political configurations of discourse and social dispositions uh, prefigure mediated action in as much as mediated practices reshape them. 
And that dialectic is something that needs to be empirically excavated in each instance that we investigate. And with this um, practice uh, framework as a guiding light, I've been uh, investigating uh, uh, right-wing nationalist practices in India and also uh, right-wing ideologues in Germany. And what I've noticed is the salience of fun in these hate cultures. And in a 2019 paper, I argued that fun should be considered as a meta practice of extreme speech. Uh, and fun is not frivolity of action. It is not pointless time pass. It is laden with political purpose. And fun as a meta practice of extreme speech unfolds in at least four interconnected ways. Being funny as a tactical way to enter and rise to prominence within online debates and by extension, the public domain, deriving fun from the sheer freshness of colloquialism in political debates, in contrast to a serious store of political deliberation and official centricity, and by mainstreaming these witty political campaign styles as um, everyday form of political communication. So we see that uh, these uh, abusive cultures are also uh, ironically offering different participatory moments for people who were not able to participate in this official centricity of public discourse. And third, fun as satisfaction of achieving the goal by working with one's own resources and finding tangible results such as hashtag trending, virality and perceived real world changes. And finally, fun as group identification and collective, if at times, anonymous celebration of aggression. And therefore, we have... Okay, yeah. And with this uh, fun as a meta practice of extreme speech, we dispute uh, with some theories. Uh, but before I get there, we, I also want to highlight how, in a curious twist, there is a formal similarity between fun and objectivity in Western normative discourses, uh, because they both embed distance and deniability in practice. And fun theory disputes with some assumptions around online anonymity. For some time now, we've been hearing that uh, online anonymity uh, is the reason for people who go online to say things that they would not say in face-to-face -face, uh, context. Um, and also because of the partially disembodied nature of online uh, identities, people don't get enough evaluative cues uh, uh, for their own actions and speech. And uh, now what we do is we try to push back, I have tried to push back against some of these assumptions um, uh, because uh, when you look at the actual scenario of uh, online uh, anonymity empirically, I found that in a local abusive context, uh, abusers operate with local knowledge. They are very well aware of their uh, victims and targets. And uh, uh, victims are also sometimes at least second guess who their abusers are. And therefore, uh, the, this particular you know, point about online abuse operating entirely in the space of anonymity is disrupted. And in, in terms of mediation, anonymity and group signals are mixed up. So to borrow from the Goffmanian framework, um, we could consider these online architectures as creating translocal scenes which are defined by a lack of insulation of observability for group members. And this is important because where we see that some of these hate speakers are constantly uh, performing to their uh, peers and they feel that they are being watched by their peers and this observability shapes their self-perception as online subjects doing different things in the network space-time and in face-to-face uh, -face, um, context uh, quite differently. And therefore, I think uh, observability is an important condition to consider and profiles and tweets and uh, likes, etc. as traces, as digital traces, they contribute to this condition of uh, observability. So with all these in mind, when Joe invited us to the workshop, we were observing and studying some, some strange phenomena on Indian online networks. A group of uh, um, Indian national um, um, religious majoritarian activists on social media had created a weird practice of auctioning women on uh, social media. It started with the uh, GitHub and they started the site where they had sourced the images and videos of women 
uh, especially uh, women from minority communities, and they put them out as deals of the day. So users could rate them, could uh, also haggle over the price, and then um, um, auction them to one another. And this uh, very strange and disturbing practice uh, invited strong criticism, and also it attracted the attention of UN as well. And here we try to see what is going on with these online auctions. Um, what started on GitHub also expanded to YouTube um, and uh, on Twitter. Uh, there were some accounts that were doing uh, these uh, auctions there as well. But after YouTube and um, Twitter brought down these videos, uh, some of these ringleaders, they migrated to other platforms and some of them actually created a Telegram group. Uh, and on Telegram chat groups and channels, we see these uh, videos that are archived and these are videos that are banned from other platforms and these are archived here. There are also new video creations and interactive messaging. And here uh, the main protagonist is, uh, is Doge uh, from the chain store from the global means world but with a Muslim skull cap. And here we see uh, anti-Muslim content but also anti-women content, extremely uh, disturbing content that I'm not, not going to share here. But clearly what we saw is the sexualization um, of um, political discourse. And uh, even in the online um, auctions, we noticed that there was a, a sexual degradation. Women were paraded as uh, objectified bodies there. But on Telegram again, we noticed that uh, sex and sexuality are running things uh, across these posts. Uh, the Muslim woman, for instance, is shown as uh, young, with or without hijab. She's sexual and sexually active and constantly seeking sexual gratification. And here, I think we need to understand that something is going on within this ideological space. There is an emic corruption between trads who call themselves traditionalists and radicals whom they blame as moderates. And trads have taken up some of these most regressive gendered uh, tropes uh, in online discourses and their activities are uh, primarily online and uh, they are splintered across different platforms and they usually build new networks or migrate to other platforms when uh, police bring them down. For instance, in an early instance uh, in 2022, a group of youth um, was uh, exposed uh, doing this and they were found to be uh, students of software engineering uh, and according to our in journalist interlocutor, their parents were unaware of what their children were up to. So this is the kind of you know, sociological uh, constitution of this tech-savvy ideological workers. And here I think you know what is interesting is that there's a lot of history and one might understand that uh, these people and these actors are also constantly deriving pleasure out of these practices. And that's what we notice in the conversations, in the thematic analysis that uh, we have carried out for this chapter. And therefore, for us, it was very interesting to note that uh, uh, fun as a meta practice allows us to account for how religious majoritarianism is renewed through the, through the pleasures of participation, where uh, these actors are drawing strength from one another and applauding each other uh, for what they have achieved uh, and scheming raid parties on opponents. And all these different factors that we had documented as fun appear to be very salient. And this is exactly what social uh, processes of hate volume um, helps us understand in greater detail across different contexts and also the media practice approach. And uh, while we think that media practice approach and social processes are very important and fun clearly is a very important aspect of this whole thing, uh, we must all also remember that uh, there is this affective charge of religious nationalism here. And uh, that particular history needs to be considered and I, there is a lot of de detail here to work with. I'll be happy to talk about it later after the event. But uh, the point here is these actors are not just swayed by online affordances. Uh, they are historically situated actors. Um, they are shaped by long histories and their privileges and motivations are actually shaped by longer histories uh, of post-colonial conditions of religious majoritarianism. And therefore, uh, I will conclude by highlighting how it is very important for us to have ethnographic sensibility to media practice, but at the same time also have historical sensibility to longer uh, trajectories of subjugation and dispossession. 
And this is something that we've done in our global analysis of hate cultures as well, when we understand and I try to understand anti-immigrant discourse and also white supremacist discourses, we see that clearly uh, well, some of these longer historical uh, continuities uh, tend to be ignored um, and sometimes social media are framed as a radically new const constellation uh, and the reason for this unexpected crisis. And uh, by pushing back, we try to argue that these moral panics recenter the liberal West as the locus of crisis, and also to uh, self-present the, the this, you know self-presentation of the West as uh, the center of calm rationality. And by uh, thinking of this historical sensibility, hey, this is not a new crisis. There are historical continuity continuities to the continuities to this. We try to argue that this close contextualization of proximate context uh, should always be combined with what we understand as deep contextualization of longer historical trajectories that frame these practices. With that, I'm going to end and uh, thank you once again, Joe Walter, and uh, congratulations on this new volume. Thank you. We'd love to take your questions and comments on the work. Yeah, so we can move into Q&A. Um, we'll have some in the room for a mic. Um, and I'll be monitoring the Q&A section on Zoom. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Kelsey, and I'm a law student here at Harvard. I'm really curious about your thoughts, not just on how these hate groups themselves um, work to proliferate and grow their membership, but also on social media companies and how they use algorithms to facilitate greater engagement with the social media um, and in that way sort of end up radicalizing people that weren't necessarily looking for these communities that um, don't natively um, belong to them but the social media company wants to increase their engagement, they feel they can do so algorithmically by getting them more involved in hate groups and hate speech, even though that wasn't the original um, sort of direction they were going. The reason I'm asking is there's starting to be litigation, at least in the United States, um, following mass shootings that are hate motivated against social media companies for not only giving them access to this information, but in some ways indoctrinating them via algorithm. That's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a big problem, and it's, uh, and, and legislation is one inroad potentially, and and uh, uh, technological changes is one inroad potentially also. And here, as you know, is is where they they bump heads with one another because of uh, First Amendment liberties and the the platforms of vested commercial interest in in getting people's attention. So I, I think I'm afraid you know about, about this as, as much or more, or more than I do. But we, we recognize the conundrum that some of the platforms are trying to make spaces nicer uh, because it's in their best interest to do so. And I, th I think we see in Facebook particularly the uh, proliferation of the private groups where you can keep things as nice as you want or things can be as nasty as you want. But it's not out in the general ecosphere as much as it seems used to have been. So, so here's a technological fix um, that maybe is trying to get ahead of a legislative fix. Um, but this is this is of course in, in American context. In the European context is different. The Singaporean context is much different. We're both both the culture and its elected um, legislature. Um, really put the lid on these things, and the tech companies have to follow suit. I I seem to have learned during my time embedded in the law school that social problems seem to be um, remedied through one of three means: innovation, legislation, or litigation. And and you hit on all three of those as a possible solution to this problem. And you will know, and you will be more effective than I in helping to push these things along. I, I would just quickly add that uh, as a platform complicity, as Joe very well mentions, is very, very important to consider. At the same time, 
There is also vast unevenness in the way platforms are being governed globally. So there are uh, instances where companies have had no restrictions whatsoever and they don't even appoint uh, a compliance officer. Although, of course, expectations of having a compliance uh, officer are also tied to some regressive measures in some context. So uh, what we need to uh, um, pay attention to is this global variation and even unevenness uh, in platform governance. Yeah, thank you. Roberto Simonowski, I'm the, the visiting scholar here at the German department, but I'm a media scholar and therefore very interested in this topic as well. And uh, if what you said about the auctioning of women, that reminded me at the, of the beginning of Facebook, where you had to rate women, that was the first idea. So I wonder whether this is the deeper uh, secret message of this medium of social media, and whether we have to understand this therefore, communication that goes on here, including the hate group communication as a kind of culture that is, uh, that is fostered by, this, uh, by these media. And this reminds me as a scholar of German literature also of Dadaism, and I wonder to what extent this kind of hate culture, this culture, these, these groups that uh, provoke each other to in, in provoking the normality and the normal communication more and more, and welcome uh, their uh, success in this regard. Uh, that reminds me of this of this culture of the Dalles who did the same. And the book by Angela, uh, um, uh, what's her name, Angela Nagels, uh, about the hate culture is uh, the title is "Kill All Normies." Uh, that refers to this kind of uh, being against the normalcy for uh, out of ideology. So I wonder how you see this this aspect. So it is hate and it's of course bad, but can we somehow see it in the tradition of a Dadaistic culture against normalcy, which itself we don't see as something bad? Well, I mean, in terms of social practices, clearly um, there is some degree of fungibility. Um, there are different ideological groups, different political persuasions, adopting similar techniques uh, for online influence. Uh, but what is therefore important for us, I think, is uh, this multi-order analysis, placing these practices in the context of who is talking and what is being said and who is it getting, um, who, is, who is it reaching and in what manner. And that sort of historical contextualization is, I think, important in avoiding drawing false equivalences and even false comparisons between different groups, although their practices appear to be pretty similar. I think you raised some fascinating points. I'll respond to a couple, if I may. I remember a book, I think in the late 90s, and I think the author was Dan Lane. The title of the book was Obscene Prophets, and he tracked at that time how the history of media has been uh, appropriated, how media have been appropriated uh, and sexualized uh, goes back, of course, to home videotape and farther to photography, to cave paintings. And so this is a, a dominant theme. Sahana discusses these, uh, these issues much better than I, but clearly it's a historical issue and this is the most recent uh, manifestation of sexualization. Um, but uh, these, these, I think, I think the, the countercultural aspects that you mentioned also of the um, uh, kill all normies, the, the early adopters who generated the hate cultures, is still pervades on the one hand, but there are other spaces where there are more recent arrivals who are using the, the tropes of bigotry uh, that they've inherited from other spaces. So we see uh, lots of Nazi propaganda in some spaces where we're seeing the, the norms and tropes of the online counterculture in other spaces. I'm not sure where they meet. I think uh, perhaps uh, uh, Stradini uh, may have his fingers on that as it appears in Fortune quite a bit. But these are certainly currents that sometimes collide and I appreciate your recognition of both of them. We're gonna take a question from Zoom. Um, I realize we're running a bit over. We're, we're about at time. I think we can take one more question here and one in 
in a room. Um, so anyway, uh, a question from Ben. Uh, wondering if it's established what portion of online haters are participating in these collective spaces. Are there, are there online haters who act more individually? And if so, are these loners still subject to the same relational mechanisms of hate creation that the community participating haters are? There's a lot we don't know about this. I think uh, many studies are showing statistically that there's an increase in online hate posting. There is an increase in the volatility of online hate posting. But whether that's more people coming online or more people influencing each other and finding out this is something to do, this is, this is ambiguous. We know very little about lone wolves. Uh, in the study of terrorism, uh, offline terrorism, it has been suggested that there are no longer lone wolves, that everybody is connected through sleeper cells and other kinds of organizations. Uh, I think this is this is a problem in thinking about the potential for lone wolf in some of the radical spaces that we see for hate online. And the, the assertion that the hatred in these spaces leads to active terrorism, which is sometimes very notorious, is, is something we have to take very, very seriously. On the other hand, if participation in these spaces led to murder, there would be a lot more murder because there is so much online. I'm afraid this is a statistical question, and I don't have the statistical answer, except these are important questions to be asked. Shall we have time for one more question? So, uh, hi, I'm a student in the School of Public Health and I'm also an online social media creator. Um, and my question is, like, what, what is it about hate that is so sticky, that drives such collect collective action? And uh, have you seen examples of more positive type of extreme messaging, like extremely <laughs> positive, uh, and and maybe like collective action that's worked in that sense? So I guess that's one question. And then kind of related, um, if I were to, let's say, change how I talk about stuff online, would hating on the negative stuff actually drive more uh, response than, you know, trying to just frame things positively? We, we need to set up an experiment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll do it. Uh, so clearly, um, what you say is absolutely right. And uh, that's also the deep ambiguity of digitalization. Uh, because on the one hand, we've seen that digital networks have also offered opportunities for people uh, to voice their uh, political opinions, mobilize, coordinate. And social media are also seen, uh, social media is seen as powerful coordinating mechanisms for uh, popular movements and uh, it has been well documented but at the same time I think uh, some of these processes that we have been documenting are of serious concern and uh, it is not I mean when one tries to quantitatively see uh, what sticks more or what is uh, more in online discourse as a whole it's a very difficult uh, research question to tackle but what is, I think, important is to understand how these hate cultures, um, how do they unfold in very specific contexts, and then understand different actors who are involved, and how do they impact political discourses as a result. And those locally specific and at the same time conceptually very rich studies um, will be one way to approach online discourse, and that's what I've been doing. Uh, two, two sets of response, and again, you will know before we do because you'll be getting the messages based on your uh, creative works. Uh, but uh, there's so much research going on now following Susan Benish's lead in the study of counter speech, messages that people can post in response to hate posters, which will either get them to deter the level of hate posting or which will comfort other people who might be, be victims. This is very important research and in line with your question, seems to be more effective when it is a group effort than, than it, when it is a singular effort. Um, I share concerns with some researchers that sometimes counter speech is what the haters are looking for. They, they will be rewarded by uh, finding, getting pushback because that's, that's what they're looking for in the first place. And my other response is that sometimes uh, sometimes the crowds gather and sometimes they don't. 
in Stravini in Blackburn's chapter, they talk about sometimes in 4chan, somebody will try to organize a raid, but if their reasons aren't good, they'll get the response, we're not your personal army. On the other hand, sometimes these patterns are so well ingrained that a simple request gives a URL and says, you know what to do. And then the raid takes place. So clearly a lot more research, a lot more investigation to find out when it goes to the left and when it goes to the right. Great. Thank you both so much for joining us. And thank you all in the room and on Zoom for joining us for this really great conversation and questions. Um, we will have the recording up of this event um, sometime in the next week, so you all can return to it. Um, but yeah, join me in thanking uh, Joe and Sahana for their work.